Hi, this is a video clip for Bayesian Data Analysis course. In this clip, I talk about uh, priors and prior information, and uh, the corresponding material is Chapter 2 in Bayesian Data Analysis, uh, Book Edition 3. Here are the um, different terms you come up with the uh, different priors, and I will, uh, to help you find uh, from the uh, from the book, the corresponding definitions and discussions. I listed the pages here. Um, the first one, conjugate prior. Um, this means that now the prior and posterior have the same form. This is uh, works only for exponential family distributions plus some irregular cases. So this is not always available. This used to be important for computational reasons, and that's also why uh, the Bayesian Data Analysis book also in chapters 2 and 3 um, uses these conjugate priors for these simple models. It's still sometimes used for special models to allow partially analytic marginalization, which can then give um, a big speed up uh, but then um, it's not needed specifically uh, when we use, for example, the dynamic Hamilton and Monte Carlo. Uh, in Stan, there's no computational benefit of using conjugate prior unless we would do this analytic mar marginalization also. Um, so in case of binomial model, um, if the conjugate prior meant that the prior has to be the same form as posterior, then we know that it has to be, the prior has to be beta form. Here I've used this uh, proportional sign so that I don't need to, so the uh, normalization term for the beta distribution, only those terms uh, which depend on theta. And then if we multiply the prior with the likelihood, so here we have the likelihood, here we have the prior. In the likelihood, we have the Y, number of, for example, the red chips, and number of yellow chips. And then we have the prior parameters, um, alpha minus one, beta minus one. And then we can collect all the terms, and it's still beta um, distribution with just new terms. So the alpha and the beta are uh, summed to the number of observations. It is now then easy to see then that these alpha and beta, because they are summed to a number of red chips or no, and the number of yellow chips, they can be also considered as a prior number of observations we've seen before. And it's just that we need to think about that it's alpha minus one and beta minus one. The beta distribution is uniform if alpha and beta are both equal to one, and then we can say that we have a zero prior observations um, about this um, process. Um, so in a previous video clip, uh, I told about this pleasant to previous example. So the ratio of um, curl babies burn uh, in the specific um, pleasant to previous case. And we have a beta prior now centered on population average. And then alpha plus beta here is now then um, telling about how much prior we totally have. And you can see that, and the kind of you think about as is the comparison to prior observations, and you can see then that when we make the prior more informative, then also uh, compared to likelihood, the posterior distribution starts to shift towards our prior, towards our the, the population average. But um, even still, we see also that the data also here is that way informative that um, even if this prior is saying that it should be somewhere um, 
plus minus five percent. It's it's still not affecting much uh, the result from the data. Uh, so the poster kind of the tail mass here has not much changed with this prior. So in this case, this is um, not prior sensitive um, our results. Um, in the previous video clip, I also talked about the benefit of integration. So even if we have a uniform prior integrating over all the possible theta values, we obtain the benefit that uh, we get some regularization. Often priors are also used for regularization and there's often made the connection that um, between non-Bayesian um, like penalty functions that priors corresponds to penalty functions which can be used to regularize and again I remind here that the also the integration helps but then also we can use priors to avoid extreme um, cases and like here even quite um, weakly informative prior makes it less likely uh, that theta would be really close to one. But we can also see that uh, still integrating over makes also that the mean doesn't change that much even if the shape of the posterior distribution changes. So there's an interplay now between the priors uh, and then the integration uh, taking into account still over all the um, uncertainty. And in, during the course, we come up with many, many, many examples of use of um, very uh, weak priors and more informative priors. And also, at uh, end of this clip, I have some. Um, then, uh, with this conjugate prior for a beta, now the posterior mean is changed, so um, equations are in the book, so you can look more detail. I just now want to point out that uh, this is now combination of prior and likelihood information, but when we get the number of observations going to infinity, then eventually this ratio goes to just y per n, and that way we get um, and the kind of the data swamps the prior. This can be seen also as the posterior variance. You can check the equation also in the book. Important thing is that we are dividing something where there's n here, and when n goes to infinity, then this variance goes to zero. So eventually, if we get enough information, um, the data dominates and the prior uh, stays fixed and then again the data um, dominates the prior. Um, the, the book mentions this and these are also otherwise often mentioned terms, non-informative prior, proper uh, prior and improper prior. So the um, there's often the tendency to say that let the data speak for themselves, uh, but flat is not non-informative. I'll take here the... If you think that how much money I have in my wallet, we can draw a line here. It can't be a negative sum of money. So here's zero and there's increasing amount of money. Now if I would put a flat prior, uniform prior, this would go forever. And flat prior in this case say, would say that it's possible that I would have their millions, billions, trillions of euros of money. That's not sensible uh, and it's not non-informative. It can be stupid. Um, it's quite likely that because you see the if I talk about how much cash there is, you can see the size of it, you would easily say that you have at least some information so that it's likely that really large sums of money in my wallet are not likely. Um, the proper prior has to have also that integrates to one. 
uniform prior if it's on the real axis or half real axis it's not too proper that can also uh, cause problems so we uh, favor proper priors improper prior doesn't have a finite integral so the posture can still sometimes be proper but it's your responsibility to check it so it's better to use proper priors um, now the the use of this very kind of non-informative and flat priors it has been um, popular but now the use of weekly informative priors is getting more and more popular people are understanding that we should really use even the weak information we have like in my example that how much money I have in my pocket even that weak information that there has to be some physical upper limit and also some logical upper limit that how much uh, I can have cash um, in my wallet. Um, so often we have at least some knowledge about the scale, like how much money there would be. Um, sometimes these weekly informative priors are based also on some knowledge based on the previous observation studies, literature, and so on. And then sometimes it's in a way that we know that this previous information is somehow related and then that's why we make it just weaker, not directly uh, comparable. Um, and we can construct these weekly informative priors. We start with some non-informative prior and make it more informative or start with strong, highly informative and make it more prior. And you can look different prior choice recommendations discussing also these weak priors uh, at the Stan uh, Development Team Prior Choice Recommendations website, so on there. Um, example of informative prior. So this is still the, uh, um, the, kind of the ratio of girl birds. And actually, based, I previously mentioned this, the population average, but there's also a lot of information in literature saying that it's actually really varying by more than half percentage from this rate. The most extreme cases are from uh, cases like the concentration camps during the Second World War, uh, people being there in um, uh, very bad conditions, there being small, but not this, this is kind of the, the um, these and other examples are telling us about this variation. Placenta previa is one of the examples where this difference seems to be a bit higher. Um, so there was a study on the, uh, on the percentage of girl births among parents in att attractiveness categories 1 to 5, assessed by interviews in face-to-face -face survey. And here's the data. So we have just the data. We can fit linear model there. And then uh, in this study, they concluded that yes, more attractive parents have more girl babies, but they did not use any prior information. And now we next look what happens if we use this. So here we have the posture distribution with default week prior, and this is what it looks like. Many, many different lines could explain the same data. If we add the prior, the prior says that it's so likely that it's just flat and we are not actually learning this very, very small data. We are not actually learning anything useful. And in, in these case, cases of very small data studies, it would be very important um, in science to use prior knowledge. Instead of trying to say that we are objective, we don't use any prior information, it should be required that your results have to be compared to what is known beforehand, and this can be used by using priors. Another example. Um, so this is from a paper, Capri and others, uh, Visualization in Bayesian Workflow. So there's a backstory is the um, estimation of human exposure to air pollution from particulate 
matter measuring less than two and a half microns in diameter, and this is called an PM 2.5. And this is important because recent report estimated that these particles are responsible for three million deaths worldwide each year. Um, yes, uh, uh, the map of the world, the black dots or the black uh, pluses are locations of ground monitor locations. We would like to know then also the um, number of density of particles also in other places than where we have these uh, ground monitors. And then we have a satellite image information looking at the diffraction of light. And there's an estimate shown on colors. And we would like to know whether this estimate is good. We want to calibrate it at the known ground monitor locations, and then based on that predict also to elsewhere. And then we can connect it that with some other information to estimate how dangerous these um, particles are. Here's a, a simple visualization of just uh, making a quick uh, linear model fit to data from different uh, regions. So on the x-axis, we have the log satellite estimate, and on the y-axis, the log PM 2.5 from the ground location states. And we can see, yes, there is correlation. Uh, the satellite information is useful, but there seems to also that the line is not always kind of identity, and we would like to learn these, how to calibrate and the calibration might be different in different parts. We would like to then have a prior for our model parameters. This is just a simple visualization model and the actual model is much more complex. This is what happens if we use the usual wake priors. I told you about prior predictive distribution. So we can do predictions based on prior. So if we use usual weak priors, we are predicting that this density of these particles um, could have this distribution. Now this is in log scale. Now it may be helping if I add some references there. There's a neutron star density. So it is not sensible that we would predict that the density of these particles would be larger than density in neutron star. There's a density of concrete. It's not sensible that we would suffocate in that kind of air. And on the other hand, Palastunturi Fels is one of the cleanest place in the world. And it's unlikely that there would be so much, much cleaner air. We can use weakly informative priors. And this is one reason why the prior predictive distributions are so interesting. We can choose to look also whether our priors are sensible by generating, uh, looking at the prior predictive distribution. Now we can see that now we have sensible priors. We are densities less than concrete. We still have re somewhat mass below Palastan to repels. That's fine because we have also clean places and ground locations. But there's also now the reference clean room level. And it's unlikely that we would have cleaner than that. It's not a problem if we have some probability mass beyond this likely, but at least we should have most of the probability mass in our prediction with good priors in sensible rates. Um, people are sometimes worried that what if the prior is wrong? What if we came up with the wrong prior? Yes, it introduces bias, but it's often still produces smaller estimation errors because the variance is reduced. There's a biased uh, variance trade-off. So it's often better to use some information, even if it might be a bit wrong from the true nature, because it still makes your predictions better. Um, the final, the, the, this is the, uh, just one of the, your first exercises the algae exercise with the binomial model, and you can then practice what uh, I talked about in uh, this video clip, 
and in the couple of previous video clips. See you.